always taken me away, making me let go of my father's hand to show him that I have to be brave to go learn to be a white man. Shirley Chichu is an actress, a writer, and artist. In the summer and autumn of 1991, she presented her one-woman show, Path with No Moccasins, based on her experiences as a child in the residential school system. It is a subject now finding its place in the themes of many other Native artists. These schools were the principal means by the government to enforce a policy of assimilation on Native people, whom federal authorities believed to be barbaric and pagan. In fact, the inferior quality of the schools, run by the churches, was a means of depriving Native children of culture, language, custom, and eventually identity. Shirley's play presented her life story in four parts. Her experience in the schools, as a young woman after she got out, searching for healing, and life now. She took the show on tour in Ontario and also to the San Francisco Indian Film Festival. After the performance of the play, people were invited to gather and talk about their residential school experiences. For many, Path of No Moccasins affirmed the idea that artists can heal themselves and others by relating their stories and bringing to light dark and painful memories. You know, the circles of discussion became part of another kind yeah. of healing. And this is a mate that I chose to be with. You know, so when I was a young kid, all I wore was moccasins until I went away to residential school. And when I got to residential school, everything was taken away from me. My sexuality, my culture, my language, my family. Total, it's like being put in a box and you can't move. The lines of boats docking in moose me. With all the children sad and mothers crying, wailing over the sound of the train whistle. My father holds my hand and I pretend to be strong so he'd be proud of me. He gives me twenty dollars and puts me on the train. He smiles and kisses me, but his eyes tell me he's sad. I run to get a window seat so I could wave goodbye as the train slowly pulls away. My sister's at the window looking out at my mom and my other sisters at the station and she was just crying. I don't want to go, I don't want to go. And there was nobody to take us to the boarding school. I was nine and Jeannie was seven. And I remember that god awful hurt and you know that, that hurt and that loneliness was to stay with me all my life. The Mounties came and got us. We were playing in a tent, I remember that. And they just put us in the, in the car and off we went. Next time I knew I was in Spanish in a restaurant. From there we got on a horse buggy and then down to the rest in the school. And then that's when I start screaming my head off, I guess. They separated us, eh? I was holding on to Stella. She was older, eh? They separated us. And we are just screaming. So from on there, I lived there for eight years straight. I remember the, the residential school as being cold and black and white. <laughs> it was, uh, the nuns were in their habit and everything seemed uh, sterile. It was a, a sterile environment. I can remember kids coming in <clears throat> from Moose Factory and way up north, the Aklavik, little children, and they couldn't speak a word of English. And as soon as they went to speak their language, they got whippings and strappings. You know, they take away everything from you in there. They deprogram you. 
they try to turn you right into a white person. I'll just put some Javex on this cloth. It should make my skin real white like my underwear does when I wash them in Javex. <laughs> my skin. I'm all covered in rash. I sure am a red Indian now. They take away your culture, your heritage. You're not allowed to talk about any of those things. If you do, it's in private, providing you're not overheard. Everybody the same. Nobody, all the same. When we had numbers, I was five. My sister was eight. I, we call each other hardly by names, just by numbers. I had natural curly hair, and they'd take me to the laundry room. Every morning, there was three girls, three of us. They had coal oil in that picture, the same thing, my hair, with coal oil. Make it straight, but my hair would curl again next morning, same thing again. That's how I lost my hair. Well, I didn't lose it. It got chopped off by the supervisor. Chop, chop, chop. Just a bunch standing on top of my head, straight up. The supervisor put a chair in the middle of the dorm and told me to sit in it. And she told the rest of the girls to sit at the end of their bunk beds. Everyone giggled. I felt sick to my stomach. And the pain kept shooting up and down my back, sitting there with my brush-cut hair. I should have screamed, but I didn't. Supervisor said, Shirley number 37 has a new name. She will now be called Woody Woodpecker. Woody Woodpecker. Woody Woodpecker. And no one is to call her Shirley from now on. Residential schools were a fact of native life for almost a century throughout Canada. They began as a network of federal day schools which were imposed on native communities in the late 19th century and became mandatory in 1920 with amendments to the Indian Act. By the 1940s, about half of the Indian student population were enrolled in 76 schools across the country. Abuses of power by the people who ran the schools were common as authorities felt absolute control over every aspect of the children's lives was necessary to civilize them. These abuses included strict and often excessive regiments of work, school, and prayer, punishment for the smallest infraction, and sometimes sexual molestation. But the cruelest blow the school struck was to the bond between parent and child. Children were often removed from their homes at the age of four, not to return until they turned 16. Ben was here. He wouldn't let them lock me up like this. But he's in another residential school. I don't even know where. Theater is only one form Native artists have worked with to begin transforming the residential school legacy. Jim Logan's series of paintings, A Requiem for Our Children, tells stories which painfully depict the loneliness and abuse of Native children in the schools. Jim was born in British Columbia and in the early 80s worked as a lay missionary in the Yukon. In his work on the reserves there, he encountered many problems, all of which, he says, pointed back to childhood spent in residential schools. His paintings have emerged from the images within the stories he heard. Images, he says, stayed in his heart. The alienation between parents and, and children is probably one of the most destructive uh, incidences that, that occurred through the school system. Um, the, the bonding that parents and, and, and children are supposed to have was, was severed in the school. And uh, I think that was part of the most destructive thing. Uh, the separation was the thing that really hurt most kids and scarred them emotionally for, for their lives. The showing of Jim's paintings at Confederation College sparked discussion and more memories. I used to wait in bed for my mother to show up. But she never, uh, she was never there. She was uh, a couple of hundred miles away. 
I couldn't realize the, uh, the distance that I had traveled uh, by train. I thought my mother was just uh, where, the, uh, where the truck picked us up. That was always my impression on uh, those first few years that I was at the boarding school. I thought my mother was just, uh, just where we got off the train. I remember my brother. When we were in residential school, I couldn't see him. And I, I used to know at a certain time, a certain day of the week, that I would pass him in the hallway. So uh, what I do was on Sunday we'd have cookies and something sweet, you know, like we'd get a special treat on Sunday. So I'd save these things for him and I, when I passed him in the hallway, I'd give him the cookies, you know, that's, that's the only way I could communicate with him. I happened to be playing by the, uh, by the big wall, I used to call it a uh, fence where nobody was supposed to go. I would be playing close by there and I happened to see my sisters uh, playing in the, uh, in the playground. So I started uh, jumping up and down. I called their names and trying to get their attention. Uh, they'd, they'd, say, they'd shake their head. Eh? And confusion started to set in. Because I was wondering, why are they ignoring me? So uh, I realized after my sister uh, got a hold of me in the hallway during one of our uh, meal breaks, and. Uh, she says, uh, we're not supposed to talk to each other. We're not supposed to communicate with each other. And we're not even supposed to be talking our language. She says, you're, you're supposed to uh, try and uh, speak the English language. The moon, the moon, come into this room. I want to know what my mother's doing. Is she having another baby that's going to end up like me? Did she get that letter I told them to mail to her? Dear Mrs. Lillian Chichu in the Bush, Ontario, I am writing this letter to prove that I can write now. You can come and get me now, Mom. I can even speak English like the older kids. I really miss you. And I miss helping you get wood. I'm really big, and I can watch you now when you're working hard. So you gonna come? Your friend, Shirley Chichu. All letters and mail was censored, uh, and um, you know it was. It was usually uh, letters were, were maybe three sentences. You know, how are you? Hope you're fine. Uh, please write. And that was it. And uh, the letters that came back from parents, they were sometimes also thrown away because they didn't want parents coming up to visit the kids. And uh, the communication was, was, um, was kept at a minimum. You know, when, you're, when they sent your kids from your home to go to school, and you're, there's nothing there for you. Eh? It's just like you're empty, you know, after they go and you're always thinking I wonder what's going to happen to my kid next time when I heard from from them and uh, there was emptiness crying it's it's really hard from the parents perspective um, the stories that I heard have, have been ones of uh, extreme guilt. They wished they could have done something, uh, but it was against the law for them to withhold their children from school. And they were forced or faced with the uh, possible, build, I guess the possibility of a jail sentence um, and the kids be taken anyways. They were faced with, if they were on relief or, or a welfare of being cut from such such uh, services. The parents really had no authority over, over the situation. Inez May's mother, Frances Peters, was born in 1919 in the small reserve of Lac de Villac. In the early fall of 1924, she was taken from her home to a residential school. 
Inez's grandfather was on the trap line at the time and couldn't prevent this from happening. His first attempt to see his stolen child was at Christmas, but by that time, the little girl didn't remember her father anymore. She only recognized him when he began to speak to her in their tongue. Her father, once he got there, he asked her how she, how she liked it, where she was. And my mother recalls starting to cry and telling him, you know, besides having her hair cut, which was quite a traumatic thing for her, she had belt welts all over her body. Uh, she was never allowed to speak in her own language. And my grandfather, he was very appalled at what his daughter was telling him. He wanted to take all his kids out of the system right then and there. But of course the priest came and he threatened my grandfather with the RCMP, which I guess the people at that time were pretty afraid of the RCMP because they were the law back then. My grandfather left and he was never allowed to go back and visit his children again. But before he left, he told my mother that some, some way he would get her out of there. I am waiting for the next day so I can be free from today. But the more I wait for tomorrow, the longer I wait, the more in jail I feel. I don't want to be me. Linda ran away. I saw her cross the first line of fence. She went down the lane, crossed the second line, the devil's line, the curse on the other side. She touched it. All the girls hanging over the windows yelling, go Linda, go, pushing her. She moved slowly the curse hanging over her head. She turned around. Everyone yelled, chicken! She still kept coming back. And when she got into the yard, she yelled, I don't want my parents to die! It was a common belief among the children, fostered by the residential school authorities, that if they ran away, their parents would be cursed. But the children still tried to run away. So my mother wanted to run away, but she was scared because many of her friends had run away and they were all caught. And of course, they were beaten. And my mother wanted to run, and one day she eventually did, but of course she was caught. And she was beaten so badly she could not walk. So they made her crawl. And they doubled, they doubled her chores. I asked my mother how she had survived. Uh, and she told me the only thing that kept her going was she remembered my grandfather telling her that she would be taken away from there. And she also thought every day was a dream and somebody would soon come and wake her up. In the face of repression by the schools, the children banded together in close-knit solidarity. There was one time one of the students from Fort Severn ran away. He was gone for a few days, and we stuck together. We were worried about him, but we didn't talk about him. It was during lunchtime, after he was gone a few days, and at lunchtime we were properly eating away, <laughs> everything had to be just so. When the supervisor came and made an announcement that David was home and would be joining us for lunch, the supervisor opened the door and David entered. It's a memory I will never forget for as long as I live. His hair was shaved off. And he was dressed in pajamas. Total humiliation. We all stopped eating, and there was total silence. And all you heard was people putting down their cutlery 
and just not eating anymore. And everything was quiet then again. We couldn't talk about anything. And he, we were informed that David would be living on bread and water for a few days. Bread and water is what he got for food for two weeks. Those were Christian, civilized people. At least they call themselves Christian and civilized. One of the terrible things about that, you know, was that those young Mohawk people had come up from from Gonawagi and Oka and uh, those places and they never saw their families again for 10 years, you know. And the most powerful unspoken message that was there constantly would just be like us and everything will be okay. Mm -hmm. oh, I wish summer was here, traveling across Moose River in a boat, water splashing my face, smoked fish hanging in rows, the water singing as it hits the shore, the loons crawls out in the middle of the lake. I remember uh, uh, snaring uh, rabbits and catching weasels, squirrels, things like that in the bush. I remember my father and grandfather used to leave early in the morning, apparently to go and look at their traps all day uh, with snowshoes. They never had any skidoos then. And I remember them as kids, we used to run out to the lake where our uh, cabin was situated towards uh, uh, evening, uh, waiting for my grandfather and father to come back from trapping. My parents and my grandfather, especially my grandmother and mother, they used to take me with them to pick uh, what today they call Indian medicine. And they used to be very close to the animals and to the plants. And of course, they used to speak the language as well, the Anishinaabeg language. But when I was in the school system, these types of teachings were not uh, given to us. Well, we just had a tent. Sometimes we just lived in open, uh, slept outside amongst the stars, I guess. And it was so beautiful, like uh, you felt uh, at home. I mean, if you can call it the, my mother's, uh, my grandmother's territory in terms of teaching our young children. I mean, her uh, institution was the land, or her university in that sense, or spirituality, you may call it the, our cathedral, if you want to call it. My mother really didn't mind the book learning or the funny language she had to learn. But what she really couldn't understand was why they were not teaching her about the earth, about how to, the ceremonies that were taught to her when she was living with her mother. She couldn't understand when, when they were going to teach her these things that she had to know to survive because she knew that all this stuff that she was learning in the system would be of no use to her once she returned to the bush. My mother, once she was released from the school, she figured she was functioning at a grade four or five level. She knew nothing of survival in the bush. She was taken in by her older brother and his wife, and they had to reteach her how to live in harmony with the earth as she had known before she was removed. I don't want to be stupid anymore. I don't want to forget about trapping and hunting too. But why won't I remember my education at school? All I remember is the full days and cold nights on the trap line. My father, he loved it there. He always smiled and laughed. Once finished with their schooling, many children came home to families to whom they could not relate, and who could not relate to them. 
Neither native nor white, they were lost in a twilight world that had no place for them. One summer I came home from Poplar Hill. I was maybe 14. And um, I was so excited to be home. And as soon as I saw my parents, I knew that it was a disconnection. I came home and I heard a baby crying. I asked my mom what the baby was, and uh, she said, that's your sister Margaret. She was born six months ago. So you lost so much. But I guess I was hungry in more ways than the physical hunger. hunger. <clears throat> the hunger for love, for the family. It's, you know, no amount of the teachers can, can make up for a mother. And especially when you're growing up, your teenage years are spent in that residential school. They can't take the place of your family. And I searched for that. And I searched for that after I got out of the boarding school when I was 17. A turtle when it's on the back has a difficult time getting back on his feet. And it's the same thing when these boys, when they left the school, you know, they had a difficult time getting back on their feet and, and trying to find their, their heritage again because they didn't fit in neither the white man world or the Indian world. I didn't know my parents. I never seen my mother. I don't remember her. When I came home, I was 13, I think. Came home on the bus. And this sister that's on the bus said, that's your mother. <laughs> and I didn't believe her. Never seen her before. Oh no, I was poor, I forgotten how she looked or anything. While the immediate legacy of residential schools expressed itself in alcoholism, suicide, and relationship breakdown, the long-term effects were also devastating. Children raised in these institutional settings had never been parented themselves and therefore could not know how to nurture their own children. There was a lot of uh, abuse done by the other children to the younger children, and I think that's because of that boarding school system. And as a result of that, when we get out of those schools, we practically do the same things to our children, to our own siblings. I did the same thing in the boarding school to one of my younger sisters, taking out that, venting that hurt, that hate, that anger. My parents and grandparents, they all went to boarding school. So I grew up with people who was the products of this residential school system. And it's going to take a long time to, to heal the people who, is, who are children of these people. The board, because the boarding school system really destroyed a lot of our culture. It destroyed our dances, songs, and language. And this is going to take a long time to fix. So I myself, in that way, since my parents went, am a product of, one could say, a broken home and a broken culture. All the while Shirley was in residential school, she kept hope for the day when she could finally come home for good. But when she finally did get to leave, she came with twin burdens of shame and anger. And she was not the only one who had changed. So had her family and her community. There was a lot of shame in there, and I didn't want anybody to know what I was going through, especially my parents, especially my dad. My dad was the key to my life. I don't know if they knew exactly what was happening, but I think they had some idea of what was going on because, like, my mom went through residential school. You know, maybe they, they hoped that there was a change, and we, didn't, we never told because you never had the trust to tell. I mean, if you live with somebody for six weeks every year, you, I mean, would you tell them anything, you know? Especially as a child. Being at the floor waiting for Uncle Mark to come home for supper, he came home drunk, and they got into an argument, and he started beating on her. I ran home and walked into the surprise of my life. There sat my father, also drunk. Because uh, the kids had left, had left a, 
a real gap in what had developed over the first five or six years of having that child at home. And to fill that gap often, and, and, and with it being compounded with guilt, you know, alcoholism became a, uh, a factor in their lives. And many of the kids remember coming back after their, their first year in school, after 10 months there, and, and seeing the change in their parents. They said, jeepers, I never knew my parents were drunks. And at the same time, the school is telling them, well, you know, your parents don't, don't know how to raise you, and that's why you're here. And Being a product of uh, those boarding schools, I led a real rough life after. I wanted to get even with society, with the white men. And every time they called me a drunken Indian, it just festered that much more. You drunken squaw, you no good Indian. And I'd hear them talking about our people on the street. Those Indians are no good, they're lazy, dirty Indians. So I had that growing up, even after I got out of the boarding school. I drink you to forget, but you won't let me. So you keep punching me with memories, so I drink more and more until I don't remember anything at all. <laughs> Once you strip the language away, you, you lose your culture. And as a result of that, what you take away is the people's identity. And when that happens, you don't really know who you are, you're lost. And people become uh, totally, delu I guess, delusioned and uh, they have no hope, they have no uh, ambition. And people get into all kinds of problems, uh, like get, they get into drinking. And uh, you, you see that uh, being, being uh, also affecting our children, not only just an alcoholic and all kinds of drugs and sniffing happening now, you know. That's a destruction of a, of a nation, of people you know, because of the impact of, of, the, of the residential school system because it stripped away the identity and the, uh, and the pride of our people. Because, you know, you were taught that you weren't any good, you were a heathen, and, uh, and all those things that we, we did as people weren't any good. You know, I looked at them as being flowers and in a certain type of uh, restricted garden and uh, you know just like flowers some kids you know they they bloomed you know they really did well in school they got an education and managed to make it through the system others became dormant like some flowers do and these kids they just built walls around themselves and didn't grow spiritually or educationally at the same time just like flowers others had died and some died just outright from homesickness, melancholy. Others contracted diseases such as TB and died in the school system. I was also hoping that there was going to be some kind of uh, a healing going on along with the play where people would be able to share their own experiences about any kind of abuse that they've gone through and how other people had healed themselves from their dramatic experiences. When I was writing it, I was feeling everything all over again. I started to see everything all over again, started to see images, visions, and that's, I mean, my play is about a lot of images and visions and dreams, and all kinds of things that, you know, we tend to keep hidden inside us because we don't want any other, anybody else to know about them. At nights I'd go home and cry. Just cry from the experience that I'd gone through all day. 
because it was very difficult for me to to be able to move through it. And I had to cry because if I didn't cry, I would hold it inside again. And my story would be told from the neck up. And it would all still be hidden down here. So I had to open my whole body up to be able to tell my story. I was very shocked when I read some of my play to my brother that he had to get up and leave. And then to find out later he was also abused. You know, and he's 33 years old and I never knew he, he'd gone through the same thing I did. We never talked about it. Water spirits of the black rocks, I've come again. Show me a sign that you are listening. You cleansed my mind, my body, and you broke my silence as I allowed you to dance with my spirit. Now I'm aching, I'm tired, and I don't want to be a wandering spirit, walking with holes in my moccasins, with no place to go mend them. Bernard Lee became principal of a residential school in Manitoba in 1958, the same one from which Elijah Harper graduated. But he soon found himself caught up in an ethical dilemma that struck to the heart of his own family. How could he justify his position at the school when he knew he would never allow his own children to be plucked out of their home and sent away? When I saw that the dormitories of our school, I thought, my, my, Charles Dickens would be very much at home here. They had a royal commission uh, to study the residential schools of Saskatchewan, to study them in depth by social workers and psychologists. And when this re report was published uh, uh, in, in about 1965 or so on, uh, then uh, soon after, and ours was one of the first in 1967, our residential school was closed. Others followed very quickly afterwards. The elders have said that the seventh generation since contact with white culture would be those to begin the process of healing and change. That generation has reached adulthood now. The prophecy is coming true. What we need to do is start teaching our young people in terms of our own history, in terms of our values and our traditions. And, uh, and that's one thing that needs to be done and needs to take place uh, in some areas already happening, start beginning to teach our young people. And you see the, the young people begin to regain their, uh, their pride and their language and their culture, that uh, you know we're not any different than anyone else, uh, we're, we're equal to anyone in the, in the world, in this country of ours, which you call Canada. We are beginning that em empowering process. Um, it's a, uh, a decolonization period for, uh, for all of the Aboriginal people. And uh, a school like Children of the Earth is, is one part that plays in the self-determining process. I'm really glad that I came to this school because learning about the native culture and everything has given me more reason to come to school. I want to come to school now and I don't want to stay home because I like being here. Because in the school you can feel a closeness. Like Once you step into the school you feel a closeness within the students, the teachers and everyone else here. The uh, Children of the Earth School believes in the dignity and the pride of each and every individual student that 
that comes through this school. For some people, healing does not come politically or with solutions from institutions. It is a personal journey. Sleeping Indian children, we were put to sleep the day we were taken away from our parents. Brainwashed into all kinds of things. I never really woke up until now. I have seven friends. Seven women sitting in a circle, all different in color. The beauties of the Sister Moon. My sisters from a different time protecting me. So I can walk into the light and tell my story with no fear, with no sadness, no judgment, leaving behind my old self. Today my knees don't kneel for anybody. Today I'm proud of who I am. It took a long time to find the real Charlotte. It took me a long time to really get into the hang of my language at first, but uh, it was a gift to me that you know everything came back to me. But today I don't tolerate any form of abuse from anybody. And I'm learning to feel. I'm learning to trust. I'm learning to dance with life again, finally. I've spoken to my mother about her feelings surrounding the residential school. She really has no bad feelings for these people who ran the schools and she also has forgiven them so very easily because she figures this is what they were told to do. She has no hate for them. She has many scars from the residential school that I, I can't look at without breaking down. But she forgives these people, people I have never met. Some people began the difficult task of reconnecting with their families by letting their parents know that they didn't blame them for sending them to residential school. For Shirley, healing came in realizing that she was continuing the maltreatment of the residential schools by abusing herself with drugs and alcohol. She honored this realization by quitting. Her parents followed her into recovery. She also attributes a great deal of her transformation to the birth of her son, Nanu. My mother was pleased, very pleased with the play, and she said it, it was very honest. And I, I know she recognized a lot of the, the stories that I mentioned, and a lot of them were probably a big shock to her because she'd never known about them. When Shirley tells her story, I feel mine will come out too, you know, the way she was telling her story and I was thinking I wish mine will come out too. Maybe I'll feel feel uh, good after because I keep it there too long. The great Spirit, help me to understand. I want to go forward. Every time I let go of something in my past, things seem clearer. The answers are coming from here. This is my body. No one is allowed to touch it unless I allow it. I have the choice to dance, to dance the dance of life. And the medicine is profoundly simple. 
and it's called L-O-V-E. It's like Mother Teresa said, you know. Uh, she said that this world is so sick, rich and poor alike, and all it needs is love. That's the healing power that we have to use. When I look at it today, you know, people that are trying to help Native people, they should understand that Native people have always had an innate, beautiful understanding of the relationship with their God and with their Mother Earth. That's the one that has to be nourished today in order for the Native people you know, to recover from the destructions that that seem to be so apparent all over. It has happened that way with me, and it's happening that way with the young people that are taking up this way. And I know from experience, because I've, I've worked with a lot of young people, and I try to teach them what the elders are teaching me. And once they grab a hold of the, you know, the philosophy and the daily use of Native spirituality, they seem to get better in coping with the modern world. You know what I think? I think we should make this biggest star blanket. Me, you, no matter what color you are, we'll put our mark on it. A star blanket full of healing colors made by us with no judgment of the past. And we'll cover our world with it, with us underneath to be healed as one. If they can find a healing in, in whichever path they choose, then, you know, just love them the way the way they plan to heal themselves. Just let them go. You know, we'll probably all meet at a corner somewhere and say, "Oh, it all led to the same place." Seeing Shirley's show, Path with No Moccasins, brought home to me the fact that there's still a lot of work for us to do in order to be free from the burdens that uh, our ancestors have gone through, which was the experiences through the residential schools. And the best way we can pay homage to this fact, I guess, is through our day-to-day -day activities in working towards being healthy and free again. We have withstood the onslaught of Christianity and civilization, and we're still here. <laughs> and it was an onslaught. Human nature is pretty strong, eh? Pardon? See, human nature is pretty strong too, eh? Right? Yeah, I'm right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm learning who and what Indian is. You see, I became ashamed of being Indian. I wanted to be white because I thought it was the white person that that was like gods and they had it all. I wanted to, I even dyed my hair and I put on the whitest kind of makeup and everything else. But today, you know, I accept who I am. I accept that I'm Indian. I can walk down the street and feel proud I'm Indian. In fact, that's my greatest asset I have. Sleeping Indian children, taking a path with no moccasins awake. I am one of them. <laughs>